right, everybody. Happy Monday to every single one of you. Before we get started on today's football ramble, we are going to... Show some fucking respect. To Vish and his Man United brethren <laughs> over what happened yesterday at Old Trafford. So let's all just take a moment, Jim. Let's take a minute mm -hmm. just to give Vish a little bit of time and space. All right, that's enough. Yep. Man United zero. Safe Tottenham. space is over. <laughs> exactly. You're now right in the thick of it, Vish. Officially. Officially. Uh, Man United zero. Tottenham three at Old Trafford yesterday afternoon. Um, Man United have now lost eight of their last 20 Premier League home games. Now, before I get your take on it, Vish, because this is what the nation, the Ramble nation is waiting for, uh, I do want to just go through a few more stats just to set the scene and add a bit of context. Um, the only league goal at Old, Old Trafford Man United have scored this season was on the opening day against Fulham we are now towards the end of September it'll be October tomorrow uh, Man United faced more XG in this game than Sheffield United did when losing 8-0 to Newcastle Spurs and Liverpool have scored more goals at Old Trafford than Man United this season uh, Jim feel free to chime in with one of your own if you want um, Spurs have created more XG than Man United at Old Trafford this season as well it just goes on and on and on um, me and Jim are going to have a little recline back in our seats turn our mics off for a minute off you go. How is this therapy? <laughs> <laughs> there was, a, there was, when I was. It's a new experimental. Imagine, therapy. imagine you have a therapist. I'm the therapist. <laughs> well, this, gen, this generally reminds me of um, the, when I was at primary school. Um, someone who was like or essentially auditioning to be the school bully came up to me and threw a punch at me in the playground and I turned and he clocked me on the elbow and cracked his knuckle. Amazing. And I got in trouble. What? Yeah. Because he said that I cracked... I mean, he wasn't wrong. He said I cracked his knuckle. Yeah. He's learned from prison movies there, isn't he? He's gone. Yeah, essentially. To establish yourself, you find the biggest dog in the yard and you throw a punch. You might get beaten up or crack your knuckle. Um, <laughs> Were you the biggest dog in the yard attention. at the time? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's tiered, isn't it? So it had to go down a few levels. Am I stalling enough here? Well, I, that's um, two minutes will, done. We'll double back around. <laughs> Can I just say, I mean, no bully worth their salt is agreeing to any kind of audition process, <laughs> first, and, first and foremost. No, but I think, you know, it's one of those things that if, if the role was there, you have to have to take it. Well, um, the, the bullies at Old Trafford, um, Vish. They were the ones in white, yeah. yeah the, the, well, there's loads of them. Um, Chiefly, maybe the referee bullying Bruno Fernandez into into sending him off the field early. But look, but do, you, do you know what the, the the what sums up that performance? I think from Manchester United is that the only dignified part of that was a was the bloke the who was the captain who got sent off explaining that he didn't think it was a red card after yeah. the game. Fronted yeah. up, didn't he? That, no, but, but that was up. the that was the only bit where I thought, you know what, it might not be the worst day in the world. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I can only speak from for, for what I've seen in the wild, but I've, I've not really seen many Man United fans suggest that they would have gone on to win that game if it had stayed 11 v 11. No, 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 well, like no, no, I mean, God, my no. goodness me. I mean, look, Gary Neville was absolutely distraught for the entirety yeah. of the game. Now, I know he's a bit of a character, but he, I, I think sometimes maybe he can and go a little bit hot on the sleeve, a bit over mm. the top. I remember him losing his temper with Jamie Carragher earlier in the season. But he did say, and these are direct quotes, Manchester United are a disgrace and the worst I've seen on the Ten Hag, and that's saying something about that first half. You're absolutely right to point it out, Jim. The Bruno Fernandes sending off was a, you know, was a big talking point, and maybe we'll go into it in a bit more detail about whether it should have been a red card or not. Chris Kavanagh obviously thought it wasn't, and the VIR didn't overturn it. But it is almost impossible to overstate how bad Man United were in that first half. Forget the scoreline, you know, forget at half time it was only 1-0. Um, it was really, really bad. The, I can't remember them ever being that bad. It was so passive. That was what struck me about it. It's very difficult to sort of like work out what their plan was. I mean, well, I suppose the plan was very obvious, wasn't it? It was like try and soak up a little bit of pressure and hit them on the break. But they weren't really pressing. Their passing was really loose. No one really looked that interested. Marcus Rashford had a really, really poor start to the game. He, he, he grew into it a little bit. But for the first 15 minutes or so, everything he tried just didn't come off. And he, he just looked like kind of frustrated to be there. Mm. Um, and he's not the only one kind of looking like that as well. It was uh, Lisandro Martinez wasn't himself either. He made a couple of co quite sort of uncharacteristic Characteristically, um, kind of, uh, kind of hairbrained lunges uh, when they were down to ten. I appreciate it. it's a bit harder to play against eleven, but I think, a lot got, of I think he's got. I think he's got that in him, though. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe. Yeah, I think he sees Romero on the other side. I, was like, I can do that as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was. Um, I, th I think even like tactically, the way Manchester United set up in that first half, it was a bit like. Have you ever? Have you watched Spurs in the last like? Yeah. You know, a year, um, fourteen months, because it was. It kind of, 
they seemed surprised. There were points where United players were turning on the edge of the box and being surprised when a Spurs player was there to take the ball off them. And yeah. it was like, this is kind of this is actually the only thing they they do well. Yeah. And you, yeah. you seem to be like totally, but, you know, unprepared for that. But in theory, though, they were prepared for it, right? Because the idea is like they're probably going to have more possession than us, so let's let's win it and and break quickly. And they were just really bad at that. Well, I I, I, I felt Man United actually. Having said what I just said about how bad they were, and I'm sure people out there will be able to point to other performances that have you know, certainly been on the end of worse score lines than they were yesterday. But that, that, I thought Manchester United were f- fortunate to not to be up against a properly ruthless side. Yeah. 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 Those Spurs have been improved in recent weeks. They're still pretty gun shy. You know, they were without Son and Timo, Timo Werner came in and his finishing is abysmally bad. It's like he aims for the keeper. It's weird, but that could have been a lot worse. I mean, if if you find, I mean, obviously we'd never know, but if you find Son in that position that Werner mm. was in a couple of times, yeah. you've got to fancy him to score. Even even a declining force that Son probably is, he still probably scores. And then it starts to get um, it starts to get really bad. And and what you find with um, with these types of situations is there comes a tipping point. If it gets to four or five, it can regularly get to a lot more than that. And I thought it was quite indicative, Vish, as well, the fact that Spurs were able to score so quickly after both. Yeah. Starts. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you just think to yourself, you didn't think Casemiro plugged that gap in, in midfield. Didn't really? seem to, mate. No. He didn't seem to. And, and I, I would just, I would just add this before I throw it to you, Vish, because maybe, maybe I'll make it easy for you by by, by ending this point with a, a direct question that you can answer, because I know there's a lot to take in as a Man United fan. You know, the last person these players are probably going to hear from before the start of the game and the start of the second half is Ten Hag. The way they responded by essentially conceding within two minutes of the first half and two minutes of the second half is possibly the most damning thing about the entire tenure at this point. And I wonder, do you think that was a performance that might get the hierarchy at Man United thinking, actually, we've got to do something here because we've made the biggest decision we've had to make with all this change at the club is around the manager. And off the back of that, it's the players we get in that presumably the manager wants to work with. And we've done all that. And look at where we are. Like, do you think this will precipitate some kind of change? Maybe in the next international break, some people are talking about to say this has got to stop because this is far too bad to be acceptable. Um, purely off the back of noise, I think because because uh, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose purely off the back of like media and um, I suppose fan reaction, really, because. Nothing. Nothing I saw yesterday was particularly surprising. That goal by Van der Ven, though. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I love that. Well, he John didn't, Johnson he didn't scored score the goal, but yeah, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. That, that sums it up better than the scoreline. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. the, the score sheet. Yeah. but the way that he could um, intercept the ball about thirty yards from his own goal. Amazing. With you know, um, Garnacho and Rashford trying to trying to break through, and then just carry it forward, and then I, I suppose this is also endemic of where where Manchester United you know, seem to be as a squad, but. When, when they're about, there's a point where he's around four United players. There's probably two chasing <laughs> them. There's two near him, and they all kind of have an after you thing in the way that, yeah. like, do you remember the first time you ever played rugby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was like, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I lost I'm the just not there. Yeah. Well, you had this part of the game. Well, yeah. you know, you do it. Yeah, um, it was a little bit like that. Um, uh, uh, but to go back to the original point, yeah, I, I've kind of. It's been like this for a while. I, th- I think the only thing that the owners have shown is that, uh, you know, when public opinion sways a certain way, then they're more than willing to get involved because it's quite an easy win for them. But, I mean, Brassel, Brassel predicted this basically before the ink was dry on his new deal, that mm. it feels like they're keeping him on to say, right, we've sorted out everything else, but, yeah, this seems to be still be a problem and we get another easy win by sacking a manager who is... Probably as unpopular as I can remember, really. The fact that, you know, there were people on phones yesterday calling up, kind of, uh, you know, revising the history of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Um, yeah. some people, some... Well, I mean, Ole, Ole, Ole had stuff. a lot of goodwill yeah. in the tank, though, didn't he? Which Ten Hag yeah. 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 he doesn't have that previous association. So Ole, Ole was more, I think, Ole, came, Ole started to come across as a bit more tragic. Yeah. It was a, it, towards the end, it was a bit more like... He would talk about May United as a family. He would still call Sir Alex Ferguson, quote unquote, the boss. You know, yeah. it, it was a bit tragic. It was a bit kind of junior school. And we school. take him to live on a farm. Yeah, yeah. Whereas with, with, with Ten Hag, he kind of reminds me of, you know, if you've got a leak in your kitchen, there's water pissing everywhere. The last thing you want when the plumber turns up is to go, oh, well, that's fucking leaking. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. You're supposed to be the one to fix it. So, like, when Eric Ten Hag was asked afterwards why Mickey van der Ven could run through the entire Man United team and put one on the plate for Johnson, Brennan Johnson to have a tap in, he just went, well, that should not happen. 
Yeah, we know that shouldn't happen. Yeah. What we want to know from you is why it's happening. Yeah, yeah. Because it's your job. And and he's also so brusque and he's so prickly. And, and you know, we, we can't we can't disagree though with the production team, or I did anyway, about Eric Ten Hag before the game, who was asked about punditry and the pressure he's under. And he said, a quote, it said, some pundits give very good advice. We have to listen. I thought he was being sarcastic. Yeah, that was the impression I got. But some people well. think that, and, and the, the reporter himself who wrote the story said that they thought he was being sincere. It's almost yeah. a bit like, well, very difficult to know. The thing is, if he is being sincere, it's it's it comes off the back of him, some very spiky comments in the past, doesn't it? And I think that we've seen a lot of a lot of managers kind of struggle to come in at Man United and, and, and get things going in the right direction. But there is a sense with Ten Hag and it is partly because of his his demeanour that the whole thing is just very joyless like there's a lot of yeah. it's very very yeah. dip, it doesn't look like a, a happy camp does it it does not look like a fun place to be for the for the players the staff for the for the fans so so it's probably quite a good time to set this against Ange and what's happening at Spurs so little things like you know I think 10 of the starters yesterday were here last season and while they have started a bit iffily that's now their fourth win in a row yeah we know he's really serious, and and this is. Um, we know he's can be kind of you know too confrontational than he needs to be for a, a Thursday morning press conference yeah. ahead of a Saturday game. Yeah, <laughs> but you but it's clear that the players love him, mm, and which the fans is love him ultimate, as well. and the fans love him, which is ultimately the most important thing. But Luke, as you were saying, from the from the, from the fact that he would have been the last person they heard from before they go out for the second half and they go on to concede straight away. Mm. Um, yeah, he, he kind of. He takes everything as this uh, Ten Hag. This is now takes everything as a slight against him. So every kind of, you know, even when he's asked about the tactical stuff, obviously it is on him. But it, he's not only reluctant to, uh, I suppose, offer the. I suppose maybe the kind of explanation that and would give that he's a bit more protective of his players. But he chews out the players and he chews out the person asking the question. Yeah, mm. and it's like, what, so where do you go now then? Uh, like, yeah, well, yeah. Where, where where have you got as you know that's protecting you from the leaky roof <laughs> it's a really good point and I think what I think one thing he singularly fails to realise I, I think over and over again is that and this may not even be because he's at Manchester United but I think it makes it more severe because he's at Man United but if you are going to manage in the Premier League full stop you've got to bounce this stuff off you yeah. you can't waste all this energy all the time on it because it keeps going doesn't it the, 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 the stories exactly. last two weeks when you, they don't need give to last oxygen. a day if exactly. you're, yeah, if you're prickly to, if you're prickly to someone in the media everyone else in the media like so as editors are going to be like they smell blood Cool. Oh, oh wow! Well, just like poke him again, then yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a Wednesday it's international big. break. Where's Ten Hag? Where's the Ten Hag dog? It makes good copy. Look, I think you know we won't see what happens with, with Ten Hag. I mean, they're either going to rumble on um, with him, and, you know, rub along and see what happens, or they're going to make a change at some point. I think a lot of it comes down to the idea that there may not be another manager available. Um, I think just a name check, Gary Neville again. He said, didn't he, um, when he was losing his temper with Jamie Carragher, he said, you know, in the summer, they tried three or four other managers. I mean, he, he basically undermined the whole club because mm. he was so angry by saying yeah, that may not have one of these other managers, there was no one available, so they stuck with Ten Hag. That's what he was saying. Yeah, yeah. If there's no one else out there that's an improvement, I guess maybe they're going to wait and keep their powder dry for a while. But just to go back to the game itself, if we can, so the big, the other big talking point, other than the, you know, Mickey van der Ven doing his um, Moses and part in the Red Sea act, was that um, uh, Bruno Fernandes um, was sent off. Now, it wasn't overturned by VAR. To me, I say this quite a lot on the show, it looked like one of those sweet spot things where it wasn't enough of an error for the VAR to overturn it. So on that level, I suppose, given that Fernandez seemed to slip and didn't seem to make that much contact, it was possibly unfortunate. The whole thing is being lost in the milieu that United was so bad anyway, but Fernandez came out and said afterwards that he was, you know, there's no way a red card, blah, blah, blah. What did you actually think of it, Vicious, from the main night point of view? I thought it was a red card as soon as I saw it, and then I saw the replay of it, and, you know, it's not a red card. Um, did you think do you think VAR would overturn it then? I, I did. I thought, they'd, I thought they'd at least encourage him to look at it, but it, it seems to me that they've, they've backed up the referee based on his perspective of the incident, which I get, but isn't the point of VAR. Right. Mm. Yes, to, to stop an obvious error, right? Yeah. I, don't, um, I think it's a, a undeserved sending off, though, should count as an obvious error, surely. Yeah. Did you, did you, did you, did you, so did you think it should have been overturned? Um, 
I kind of do actually. Yeah, yeah I think okay. in a in a sort of common sense way because yeah. it affects the game so so massively. There's a lot of weird flaws with VAR, like sort of not being able to interfere on a yellow card, for example, yeah. which can have a huge huge impact on in on the game. And I'm sure these things will hopefully be ironed out over time eventually. But I just felt like you know in in the spirit of of why that's a red card offence, I think it, it's it's harsh to say that it meets the threshold of that because he clearly slips mm. and like it. It's like kind of like the outside of his foot that he he hits him with. As yeah, well, it's like the it? back not, of his ankle. Yeah, it's not it's not really that dangerous. And then Madison at the end. It's quite funny. There were two reactions from two players there. Brennan Johnson <laughs> straight away goes to Bruno and clearly like mimes. You've lost your head, mate. You've lost your yeah. you've lost your head. And Bruno's so confused that he's been sent off. Um, that it's probably made worse when at the end Madison puts his arm around him and almost shrugs as if to say, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they were having a good chat and Madison did look like he was being quite sort of, you know, um, yeah. Yeah, quite sort of confused about why the whole thing happened. You know, you were talking about before about um, Spurs being clinical, or, or, or uh, sorry, Spurs not being clinical enough. I thought it was, it was really interesting that I, I think Brennan Johnson, obviously, you know, with his form at the moment, is going through a real purple patch. But... I also think that he, in, in different ways, could have been a bit more clinical. Even the assist for the Kulusevski goal comes off the back of like yeah. quite a heavy touch. Because and then it, yeah, he, he also delayed a bit and it got deflected up. Yeah, Kulusevski yeah. was amazing with his um, and he was he was uh, yeah, yeah he, he was the best player on the park by a country mile. He was, yeah, Kulusevski in that ten role has been outstanding. Look, I think before yeah, we can talk about Spurs now if you want, but just before we do, I just I just sound the United um, side of it. If I was a United fan, I'd have come in. To this game being God, what's going to happen? You know, what what we're going to get? I would have been pissed off at the start, doubly pissed off when we went down to ten men. But to be honest, when the final whistle went, I'd have been relieved. Yeah, and that's it, why. It that's why worse. because there's teams in the Premier League, as we know, that will 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 smash a Man United team that plays like that. I mean, it's actually it's actually embarrassing how bad they were, particularly in the first half. And what is what? I know Spurs are off the back of some good results now, and they seem to have started to find their feet. They've ha- they've shown on occasions this season though that they could play for ages and never look like scoring. And I think the reality is this is going to sound like I'm taking Hank away from Spurs, and I don't mean to because I do think Johnson's been good. He's got four in his last four now. Dominic Solanke's actually been really good as well. Probably not got the goals he's deserved. Although of course he's he, he's got three a, and three now. He scored a great striker's goal uh, yesterday. I think um, you know they didn't have to be that good. That's the reality. Yeah, yeah. And, and um, so what do you make of Spurs more generally then? I mean, Mikey Moore came on. He's really highly thought of, a really exciting young player. Spurs are able to do something that Man United weirdly aren't able to do, which is bring on um, uh, quite exciting subs. You know, whether they're young players or players that can affect the game. You know, Bergvall came on, took a corner. You know, the goal comes from that. You know, um, I, I think they, they, they look quite interesting now, Spurs, off the back of these four, four positive results. Um, you just your mention of Bergvall there, because um, obviously he was he was subbed off when um, when Spurs got a red card on in, in midweek in the mm. Europa, didn't they? That's right, yeah. Um, Dragerson went, uh, went That was further, it, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, and I like the idea that as he walks off and just in his ear, don't worry, you'll, you'll eat on the weekend. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about that. It's going to be a fucking buffet <laughs> the weekend. Enjoy yourself. Is, it wasn't really a buffet, was it? I think you're right to mention Timo Werner. There's a point where he's he's bearing down on goal and he shoots straight at the goalkeeper. And I, I'm, I'm minded to think that if you don't try a dink in that situation, it possibly should be a yellow card. Yeah. It's like not volleying it from the edge of the area yes, if it falls 100%. to you there. You, you just have to do it. Yeah, criminal offence. Andy, yeah. Andy, Andy says that Werner used to be a great finisher. Yeah, I mean, he's got yeah. a lot of goals for Leipzig, didn't he? I mean, he was he was linked with Liverpool for a long time before he went to Chelsea. And he, so he seemed like though. this sort of dead-eyed kind of yeah. serial killer type striker yeah. um, but he is frustrating yeah and uh, I think it looks it seems like a confidence thing doesn't it he's in that he's actually, spiral yeah he's, he's in his own head he's very he? softly spoken as well and I, I think he's, he's like he's he sounds like quite a sort of he almost sounds a bit like a for want of a better term a, a big nerd like when you hear when you hear him speak it's like oh he actually doesn't seem like yeah. this sort of a bigger boy nerd a bigger boy nerd yeah. yeah doesn't seem like the sort of confident kind of um, goal getter that you that you would expect him to be from essentially how he looks and yeah. the ones who have yeah. loads of sex those goal games. exactly yeah yeah, yeah exactly right. the, the shaggers the goal shaggers <laughs> my local landlord is the best combination I've ever seen of a nerd to the point where he does like Dungeons and Dragons nights at the pub but also hard I've right. seen him like I've seen him like physically chuck people out the pub and you don't get that combination very often are you no. saying Timo Werner might be that it could well be that could well be if that. he starts scoring again if well I mean let, let's hope so I think it, it, it might it might grow in every element of com- of his life if he starts scoring goals again do you see the way that people have started you know for uh, maybe for a while actually but they've referred to him as the roadrunner right 
I mean, you like Wiley Coyote would catch a Werner Roadrunner <laughs> instantly, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah. He'd catch himself. Yeah. So um, the thing is, I would say aside from the, those two two chances he should have done better with, he actually had a pretty good game though. He like his, his all round performance is pretty useful for Spurs. He's a great player to have holding the ball up there. Yeah, he uh, meet me Mazraoui a few times. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he did. He, look, he's got frightening pace. His position he put quite good. Very strong. And, and the one thing you'd say about yeah, he is strong. One thing you say about him is he's quite relentless, doesn't seem to let it get him down. He still gets in those positions. And I think, you know, it's also not easy for him because he, you know, if Son was fit, Werner's not going to start the game. And it's quite interesting. Spurs have come off the back of a, quite a few good results now. And, and when I was at the North London Derby, I just I looked at their forward players and I thought, you know, really, does any other big club really want those forwards? You know, and now really, you know, Kulusevski scored a goal. Johnson's hit four and four. He mm. can look a bit powder puff, Johnson, when he's not um, on yeah. form. Goal and assist in front of his cool dad. Yeah, there we go. Exactly. Yeah, what cool dad? What a yeah. cool dad. Cooler than him, which is, must be <laughs> yeah, debilitating for yeah. him because he's a Premier League footballer. <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. So look, it's it's positive for Tottenham. They 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 they, they yeah, look as Jim to paraphrase you, Jim from last season talking about Sheffield United. They were happy to cash in their Man United voucher at the right time, right? <laughs> Right place, right oh time. Oh, God, has it come to that? I think yeah. it might have done. And it's a generational thing as well. You know, when um, your uh, like your aunt or whatever might get you uh, a, a voucher to Fortnum and Mason's, you're like, mm. am I really going to use this? And you yeah. end up yeah, maybe three times a year, yeah. yeah. <laughs> finally, finally um, Vish, I, I got a lot of stick for... Um, for saying uh, on Friday that Maynard are basically you know, a glorified mid-table team, right? That now looks but, generous. No, but but like... It looks generous but, now. But, but that, I suppose that's part of the problem, isn't it? Because presumably you're getting stick from Manchester United fans. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know but uh, on this particular it's thing, you get stick from family. everyone else. Well, there's <laughs> other stuff, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I mean, that's part of the problem, isn't it? Like, you can't... You have to... You have to reassess like where your team is. You can't just be like, well, but they're we, always going to we have twenty years ago. But Manchester United are always going to have title-winning attention. Yeah, the tension of teams who are going for the title. It's never going to change. Yeah, but but you but but I, I think you know uh, your your ambitions should change and what you want what you want from life. I, yeah. I, I think I think they're just a uh, you know they are in big trouble. I think mid-table now looks generous based on what we saw yesterday. I think it was um, it was a kind of performance from them where if you had seen a promoted team to the Premier League play like that at home against Spurs, you'd have gone. They need to fucking sharpen up quick. And you'd feel so, and up. you'd feel sorry for them. You would. Yeah. You think what they're going to do? It yeah. just seems consistent with last season, though, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. Nothing's yeah. really changed. Mm. I suppose the one thing they need to do is that if they do decide to sack Ten Hag uh, before December, they need to do it quickly, and they sh- they do not need to go down the route they've been through many times before of getting in an interim, just. Whoever the right man is, would he work out? Just try and entice him in. Give it geeksy to the end of the season. All right, moving down through the country, back to London, where we're sat right now. Uh, Chelsea beat Brighton 4-2, thanks to a quite remarkable performance uh, from Cole Palmer. I mean, he was absolutely unplayable. The first ever player in the Premier League to score four goals in a single half. In fact, he scored all four of them in the space of 20 minutes. Um it was an incredible performance from him. I mean, Chelsea still did their bit and gave away a couple of comedy goals, which I'm sure we'll come on to. Uh, it was an amazing performance by them, uh, especially when taken into account the idea that I actually thought they would struggle at the start of this season to merge and have a mix and a blend of all these players they seem to have. But um, they were decent, right? Yeah, I think we are but weeks away from athletic deep dives asking if Chelsea are title contenders. Yeah. Uh, because they, I won't be reading that. No, absolutely too, not. Too many, it's too, too long. long. Way yeah, too long. It's too far, long. Far, far too long. Um, but... But um, they look fairly formidable going forward. I think obviously Brighton helped them with that they high did. line. They did. Um, and some sort of quite um, panicked playing out from the back at points, which, as you've alluded to, Chelsea did themselves. But, I mean, Palmer is so, so perfect to exploit that type of weakness. And they actually look really well set up to exploit a lot of weakness in teams. They look, they look a lot more gelled than you would expect them to. Yeah. And I think people talk about the turnover of players, but it's, you know, the the quality of it. Like we were kind of wondering if this would happen last season. I think Enzo Fernandez, Moise Caicedo, there, there are a few players there. We think they're, they're better players than we've seen so far. And that's probably to do with a lot of the chaos that's been going on around them. They, you know, they seem to be better now. Sancho's hit the ground running. Palmer's obviously been really consistent. There's so much depth in that forward line. Um, and Kunku's come in and put pressure on Jackson. I mean, that's, that's bringing the best out of him as well. Although, you know, he obviously didn't score at the weekend, but he, he looks a lot better than he did last season already, just generally. There's a lot to be excited about there. I suppose it could just be a very good run of form. And we, we see what happens if, um, you know, if they... If they come up against a team who are a bit cannier at shutting them out, because obviously Brighton played into their hands, but it's, yeah, it was just 
they're an absolute box office at the moment. So much fun. And I think it's interesting to see how to Cole Palmer, we know how good he is at penalties, but we've now discovered that free kicks are just big penalties to hit. <laughs> yeah. It works in exactly the I same mean, way. Mum, can we go get big penalties? No, not now. <laughs> you would definitely call it that as well. Yeah. <laughs> you definitely call it that. I love the big penalty. Um, most notable for me was when he had a great chance for a fifth goal mm. and he was so fucking angry he didn't score. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you, you think, oh, he's already scored four. You know, his... his, his, his um, look, the only downside to this for him and for us is that Tim Sherwood did the cold Palmer celebration on live TV, and we don't need that. No, you know, if anything, you know, that's that's the shark jumping element of it. We don't need. Are you wearing a gilet? You shouldn't be cold. But, yeah, he wasn't wearing a gilet on the telly. Oh, he no, probably he had wasn't. one under his. Yeah, no. um, yeah he, he wasn't allowed to wear it, and he said, "I haven't felt this bad ever." Um, he, <laughs> like a, he's wearing like a bulletproof vest. <laughs> Yeah, Tim Sherwood wears a stab vest on Soccer Saturday. Like, like an informant. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, look, there's been a lot of um, chat about Carl Palmer after that performance. Some people saying that um, who was it? Someone in the, one of the newspapers, I forget now, said that they England need to build their entire attacking lineup around. Them. I mean, maybe is there a player better than him going forward in the Premier League at the moment? No, um, I, I don't. I don't know how you do that tactically um, without upsetting all the other good players you're going to have. Mm. And part of me also doesn't care because yeah. there's something about... If he is the best player there, he should play there. Yeah, Absolutely. and also like he he seems to have been plucked off the Man City production line at the ideal point for, I suppose, for Chelsea's needs and for our enjoyment because it feels like he's come off just before they've um, installed the filter. Yeah. <laughs> because I reckon there are a lot of players, I reckon Phil Foden, I reckon, you know, even, even what we see of Rico Lewis, I think there are a, lot, a number of exceptional technical players at City and we even even some who weren't reared at City in you know Bernardo Silva and De Bruyne who can do a lot of the th- same things that Cole Palmer can do but they don't for efficiency's sake in the Guardiola system yeah mm. and they managed to pluck him out essentially or he wanted to leave at a certain time where he's got he's still got hold of all the bits that say what if the only way I can play this one time through ball to Nicholas Jackson is to Hit it so high it almost touches the fucking moon. Yeah. What if I would I would prefer not to be playing it to Nicholas Jackson. He's probably <laughs> yeah. thinking, but I'm going to play it anyway. Would um would it be the worst thing in the world if I bent this forty yard uh, free kick into the top corner instead of laying it off to the full back to then get it back and then play him inside? <laughs> probably not. He does a lot of things that because are the there's fun so much things. happening at Chelsea that no one will notice. Yeah, exactly. You do what you want. Cole, you know I mean? what's Cole doing? No, he's, no, he's all right. He's just climbing a tree. When I, when I, when I worked at um, a supermarket, it was massive. And on the Saturday, it was really busy. And I've said this before on other outlets, but I'll just repeat again. I sometimes used to go in in the morning, say hello to the manager, go home for a bit, do what I wanted, then come back. And they wouldn't notice. <laughs> Cole Palmer's doing that at Chelsea. Yeah. yeah. Isn't he? Yeah, I'll do what I want. But, he, I want. but he's doing it in the way that, like, you know, you'd like a fairy to tidy your house. Yes. Like he's, he's doing that and yeah. he's, like, fixing He's everything. using his forces for good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he's, yeah. He is a really, really instinctive player. And that, that chance for the fifth goal is, is an interesting point. Comes to come on his right to. foot, doesn't it? And he just bam, doesn't but pull it over across. It across reminded me of last week when Erling Haaland was on a hat trick. And I think it would have been four hat tricks in a row or what, whatever it was. It would have been some ridiculous record. Um, and when he's on two goals, he's suddenly really thinking about it. And, uh, and it, he's not quite as good because he wants it so much. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think there may be an element of that. It might be the first time we've seen Cole Palmer think. Yeah, I, mean, that's, that I, don't, I don't think that's a good thing. No, yeah. it's not a good thing. He's a super... We don't want to overload player. him with information, yeah. as Gareth Southgate yeah. said. Yeah, but, yeah, well, yeah but, but there is a lot to be said for that. I was, I was talking to a mate of mine um, yesterday and he made the point that... Do you remember when Suarez was coming through and it was at the point where Rooney was basically tailing off? And I can't remember who it was, but someone made the comparison of... Rooney's lost the street footballness that Suarez has yeah. and he's lost it because he's been in the game quite a while. He's knackered, obviously, and he's he's playing within himself to a point of like, to maintain a certain level, I need to, you know, be this fit or kind of conserve this amount of energy. And there will come a time, well, naturally, when little things like when Cole Palmer fails, that it will, you know, weigh a bit heavy on him. Mm. When... 
um, when he gets older and suddenly he has to think more about being responsible because right now he's he's so responsible for all the good things Chelsea are doing but he's not playing with a, like a bloke with responsibility and no. he's in that incredible sweet spot he does seem like the type of character to be able to wear that like just so easily though he's, yeah. he is so he's got such cast iron confidence and like, it's, you can it's see really that. impressive thing you can see that when he takes a penalty yeah exactly like yeah. Marcus was saying before wasn't he you know when he, when he first came into the public consciousness and I think he was interviewed after a game and someone said oh, you know did you, were you nervous about the penalty and he was literally like what yeah, why ne- would I'm be? never going to miss but a penalty but the way he carries himself in interviews as well you know, we, we sort of joke about him kind of um, you know thinking very little and, and you know you see that sort of stuff all the time but he is co- clearly unfazed by the fact that he's now a household name it's yeah. just bounced off him yeah, so he, he's clearly got the type of personality to succeed at that level and also his mates probably aren't knocking him out in his kitchen <laughs> probably I don't think we can guarantee Wayne that yeah, we of, don't you know, know. Lo- lose a yard I yeah. think that might well be his origin story <laughs> to be honest but Ch- Chelsea Chelsea are uh, two points off the top now and in the words of Paul Rudd look at us who saw that coming not me <laughs> I didn't I didn't see it coming at all um, quick note on Bryant before we move on and have a break um, the, the Fabian Hertzler said you know he, he, he wouldn't like to be drawn on whether the defensive tactics Brighton um, Brighton kind of occupied were, were, were sensible or not he said he'd like to speak to his players first I think he'll probably be speaking to Lewis Duncan Adam Webster before anyone yeah. else because they think they're enjoying themselves very much but Brighton have started the season you know overall pretty well um, I think a lot of us in our predictions at the start of the season had them finishing you know, mid-table they started really really well at the start of the season they haven't won in four now um, so I mean are we really going to draw too much from from them going to Stamford Bridge and getting beaten by a really good Chelsea side or we, do we not care about that? No I mean I think you know like as as Jim was saying Chelsea are a bit more consistent now the only person in that 11 who wasn't there last season was Jadon Sancho so they're obviously playing Three with, assists now already for Chelsea Yeah yeah, yeah it makes me like look good more. doesn't it? I, 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 honestly I'm just happy he got out Yeah I, I yeah. want that I want that same thing for Rashford in well, The same thing for yourself don't you? Yeah well, you're, you're, you can, That's the beauty I'm of it though, you it. can never get out I'm the one holding the door you yeah. just run through, lad. Yeah, yeah. You, you can never ever leave. That's I'll, the thing. I'll play the violin with the rest going of down, the Americans. Yeah, going down the Titanic. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Before we move on, um, can I bring you, bring to your attention something Enzo Maresca said in the post match? He said, "Overall, I think we completed this evil," and then corrected himself. <laughs> So the mask has slipped at Chelsea there. <laughs> right. Just want to bring that to a wider audience. Wow. It reminds we'll me of... see um, you. Have you heard the story about the guy who was online a while back and the guy who said he got a Polish neighbour, he's really nice, but the Polish neighbour had a baby and uh, he was... And this next door neighbour was, was mowing his lawn really, really loudly in the morning. And he was like, oh God, they've just had a baby. I better just go and check it's not too loud. So he knocked on the door and the um, and uh, he said, uh, oh... Um, I've just started mowing the lawn. I know it's really noisy. And the Polish guy had come to the door holding this brand new newborn baby. And he said, that if it's really noisy, um, just let me know the best time to be able to do it because I really need to mow the lawn. And the Polish guy just said to him, this child must not be an obstacle. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, that completes the first half. Coming up in the second half, Everton are back, baby. Uh, we marvel at a potential goal of the season and we finish the show by performing uh, the first living autopsy on Tim Lovejoy. Don't miss it. <laughs> Favourite post-match meal? I don't know, you know. Chinese, perhaps. What's your order? Salt and pepper chicken. Yeah, rice. Not salt and pepper chips too much, that. Yeah. But you know, you, have to, you know, chippy chips. Yeah. They have to be them chips. I yeah, don't yeah, get them. yeah, 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 proper. Yeah. You know, the, my favourite thing about that interview isn't Cole Palmer. It's the interviewer who... Trying natu- to get involved. But, but naturally, we all, we all do it. You want to make the other person you're talking to feel comfortable. I so don't. you're like, you kind of... <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's the opposite of what I want. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, you end up in a situation where, like, if you've got to, like... I suppose, like, strip away a bit of yourself or dumb yourself down, you do it. And it got to the point where he couldn't go any further. Can't, I can't, yeah. I've, I've gone with you as far you as like I can. Chips. Yeah. Yes, well, chips, yeah. yeah. I'm just you making like noises past it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Welcome back to the Football Ramble. Um, thanks to Friend of the Ramble, Moon, uh, for sending us that clip. Um, you can become a Friend of the Ramble too by heading over to patreon.com forward slash football ramble. You'll get access to the Discord where you can chat with us and other Ramble listeners and get ad free episodes of the Ramble up front and on the continent. And a reminder that if you want to get in touch with your stories, questions for the mailbag or in response to anything at all then email us at show at footballramble.com that's show at footballramble.com now 
One of the big talking points on the Discord with our Patreon subscribers over the weekend was whether James Justin's goal against Arsenal was in fact the goal of the season so far. I think it was. A lot of patrons were saying it's um, John Duran's bullet from miles out for Aston Villa a few weeks ago. Um, but Arsenal did end up beating Leicester 4-2. Uh, a great win for them. They, they left it late to do so. But... Um, but that goal from James Justin, my goodness me, Jim, you were at the game. I was at the ha- game. Did you, what, ang- talk us through the angle you had on that James Justin. You would have the perfect angle. I had a really good you? angle. Yeah. yeah. So we're at, at, essentially at the other end of the stadium, but by the sort of uh, by the corner flag. So I saw it come in, saw it curl off his boot. What of the post? Is it, is it the goal? Is it the goal of the season for us so far? No, I think it takes too long to get into the goal. Oh come on! I don't I think, think he. I I I don't like it. Because it it should go in the goal quicker. I mean, I didn't like it. <laughs> yeah. So let's see, yeah, two out of three. Yeah. But was, it, was it one of those? So the, the rarest of beasts when you know you've seen a truly magical goal is when the opposition fans go "fuck you now." Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, there was a bit of that actually. Right, um, it, sort of involuntarily from my own mouth actually, if I remember rightly. Um, but I, th- I think that the time it takes is a good thing, right? It's the, aesthetically, but it's, it's quite just, pleasing. Yeah, and I suppose he doesn't get the curl if he doesn't hit it. On, the, on that particular part of the outside of his foot, but I think we're we're close to the threshold of scuff when we talk oh, about that kind harsh. of. Oh fucking hell! That's yeah, harsh. I'm gonna say. Listen, it. I know you're hurting. I know you're hurting. <laughs> you still talking about Rooney really shinning in that overhead kick? <laughs> yeah, no I thought it'd be fun. Fine, shinner. Garnacho, not a shinner. I can't tell you the last time, if ever, James Justin scored two goals in a game. He's probably but, yeah, never done I it. I think he said in the post match. He's never done it, right? Yeah. That was an absolute beauty. It was. It was. It was. It was, such, it was a great goal. Uh, to me, as I said already, it's the. It's the, it's the um, it's the best goal we've seen so far in the Premier League this season. Um, Arsenal did need two stoppage time goals to beat Leicester at home, which was kind of surprising going into it because you, you, rightly or wrongly, and maybe this sounds disrespectful to keep Steve Cooper's brave boys, but you look at that kind of game on paper and you go, right, you're putting players from your fantasy mm. team in the half <laughs> of them there for that because they're going to win. It didn't turn out like that, Jim. How, no. how did the game transpire um, from it within the stadium? Because Arsenal, what, 2 and up at half time? Yeah. Leicester pegged them back. Um, what was the kind of feeling in the, in the stadium when that happened? So the, the, it was sort of one of disbelief with the pegging back because the first half was so, so dominant and the sort of the stats bear that out as well. It's one of those ones where you kind of think, God, we've seen so many games at the Emirates in particular where the second half just doesn't have the same intensity for whatever. And I was literally sort of talking to, to my friend who I went to the game with about how like, you know, we've seen this so many times before you have some sort of some unpredictable element of, of misfortune, like a deflection from a free kick that leads to a goal and then it changes the energy in the game. So you, you kind of have to be dominant when you're on top. Um, so there was a sense of like, we've seen this all before, but not for a while and it's frustrating. Steve Cooper is is very good at setting up teams to, to frustrate, isn't he? And to, and to make things difficult for you. Um, and there was an element of thinking, oh God, is, are we going to drop some silly points here? At the same time, the, uh, the 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 goal for three two wasn't a surprise because we've seen Arsenal do that so much, and they were putting so much pressure on. Very impressive um, when Ethan Munieri came on; um, he was kind of game changing actually in terms of Leicester suddenly had a problem to deal with that they weren't used to, and that kind of mixed it up. He won a lot of corners. Of course, one yeah. of the goals came from a corner that he won, so that was very very encouraging. They're so good at that. Mm. Arsenal mm. are so good at that. Like I mean, I don't know how many they've scored from corners this season, but it's a lot already. They they are noticeably better than every other team in the Premier League at attacking corners. Mm. Uh, you, it's do, wild. Do you think you'll get to the stage where? Do you remember there was a point where Rory Delap's throws for Stoke City were so effective? That teams would just start kicking the ball out for corners. Yeah, <laughs> of yeah. They, should, yeah. they should start doing. They should get do whatever they can, can do to. Yeah, just do whatever they can to avoid it because Arsenal seem to be. I mean, first of all, they've got a very big team, and obviously they've got technically yeah. good players yeah. who can deliver the ball well. But, yeah. you know, on the Steve Cooper side of it, you know, he had a lot of stick in the in the, in the week um, when they only just went past Warsaw in the League Cup. You know, there were there were fans, Leicester fans, there singing Cooper, sort it out, and this is embarrassing. So, so it was reported that fans were singing Cooper, sort it out, Cooper. Cooper sort it out. I, I can recognise that chant in my mind. Apparently, one of the other charts were, were quote, this is embarrassing. Was it, this is embarrassing? I would think so. Yeah. That's quite weird. I think that's yeah. quite a weird chant. Oh, you hear it sometimes here Do and you? there. Yeah. Old Trafford probably happens. <laughs> uh, and it actually, whenever, like... Uh, You're gargling at Old Trafford because the water falls in your face at the same time. Yeah. <laughs> it's like singing in the shower and you accidentally get a mouthful of water. I think it's, it's a cousin of, what the fucking hell is that? Yeah. You know, if ever any sort of set of fans does something um, slightly out of the ordinary to, to raise the atmosphere in their own 
stadium, you mm. get away fans doing oh, it. Oh, yes, of course. And, and yeah. those are, they are all the type of people that seek out an Irish pub on holiday, I would big, imagine. Big time. Uh, listen, Jim, that's snobby of you, that. Yeah, yeah. Nothing wrong with that, is Quite, it? I, I'm just embracing it. It's, it's very fair. hard to not come across as smug with this voice, face and personality, so you just got to lean into <laughs> it. <laughs> Agree. <laughs> Um, Did you like seeing Vardy back? I appreciate he didn't yeah. actually do anything. He yeah. didn't have any touches in the box. Well, that's and, ideal for like me. Yeah. Got um, a booking now. Got himself a booking. He did. Um, and he actually got... A, he was instrumental in Leicester's goal, actually, because he got in front of Saliba in a way where he sort of had no choice but to foul him. It was very, very cleverly won for they, 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 They're kind of... Jamie Vardy is the closest thing you're going to get to someone who can confusingly undo Gabriel and Saliba. Massively. Because they're going to yeah. be like, we can deal with any challenge. Is but, this, but this is quite non. This is quite non-traditional. Yes. It's like when you. I, I don't know if it's only in cartoons, but you know, like maybe only in cartoons where like elephants are scared of mice. Yes, exactly. It's exactly yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then this mouse is um, full of energy drinks <laughs> and uh, omelets. Yeah, has got some really, really robust opinions. Yeah, <laughs> and it is not at all. Uh, and, 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 and compared to the mouse, I suppose is also very, very in touch with how powerful he actually is. Yeah, because the yeah. mouse it would be a surprise to the mouse as well, wouldn't it? It's not a surprise to Vardy. No. Yeah, he's not no. quite the mouse from American Tail, is he? No, he's definitely not. Rival, yeah, definitely so, not. Steve Cooper had some issues after the game um, with refereeing decisions and uh, he said that um, there was a foul by Saliba on Vardy in the build-up to Arsenal's first goal, which I, I, I think that was a little kind of... Didn't he also say he felt like Calafiore should have been shown a second yellow card he, for he, a foul as well? And I cannot believe he wasn't. I really, right, like, really? So, certainly looking back at it, like, I, I, I thought at he least got away with it in the stadium but then seeing it on Match of the Day, I, was like, I cannot believe he's not got a second yellow. At there. least he, he's, he's done a decent thing and got himself injured. Well, so yeah, I'll suspend yeah, myself. I'll suspend myself. Had a little bit of a knock in the... Um, in the uh, in a celebration, apparently. So, what is it with Arsenal and that? I don't know. Yeah. It's a dog. I mean, it? so I I think it might not be as bad as feared. People saying like, oh, he's, oh there's pictures of him in a knee brace, but it's literally like just like like a like a knee sock thing. Oh, like, to okay, hold him like so ice maybe or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's not so bad. Hope not. <laughs> Do you think um, there's anything in the fact that you know Man City dropped points and Arsenal won, and so now they've, they're joint on points? Or was it just too early for all this kind of chat? Because if you look at it, I think it is probably a bit too early, chiefly because Fulham are only four points off the top. Marcus has made yeah. made me say that, uh, even in his absence. Liverpool are a point clear. Um, Aston Villa are doing; you know, they're two points off the top. It's too early for all this stuff. Yeah, way too early. Manchester United are four points off relegation. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you you always want you know you rather to drop points, and it, yeah, and it also, matters at the end of the season. But it's absolutely. we don't know if it's part of a wider trend yet. And I think we know now, given how relentless City have been, that like, the points now, um, you know, they cost all, well, they're of the same value as they are at the end of the season. Mm-hmm. And, and you they have just to... motor through, don't yeah, they? Yeah. So... And also, they'll be adjusted to life without Rodri by then. So, yeah, I'm not, I'm, I'm not counting any chickens yet. I just also think as well, if you're an Arsenal fan, um, yeah, you, 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 you're fully aware that you've, taking Man City to the very limit for two seasons in a row and it's still not been good enough and yeah. you'd be forgiven for thinking you know what actually that's two points we've gained on them even though it's only September you mm. know Man City dropping points against Newcastle you, you basically are in a position you know this is not going to happen but you are basically in a mindset as a, as a neutral where you think well every game you think Man City are going to win it it's mm-hmm. a surprise when mm-hmm. they don't win so I think it's of note um, but yeah a good win for Arsenal they had to leave it late to do it um, and that's the good thing about the Premier League it can surprise you um, but they got out the back of uh, out the back of it and, 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 and did okay alright um, easy yeah <laughs> it's not hanging out the back of it so they got out the back of it it's very different um, Brentford uh, just change the subject quickly before we move on to Everton the Ace Ventura <laughs> yeah I used to think that. What, you're talking about the second movie yeah, yeah. where he comes out the rhino yeah. I used to think when I, how old would I have been when that, what year did that come out let's try uh, to find out what year that came 80, out f- no, not 80 uh, 95 so 45. I was 14 when it came out that scene when he comes at the back of the rhino around my mate Dave Watson's house, uh, not that, not the Everton Dave Watson, different guy. Um, we used to, we watched that so much that we wore the VHS tape out. <laughs> we used to think it was the funniest thing yeah. we've ever seen, along with a audio tape we had of um, comedy songs by Adam Sandler. Wow, that's my comedy genesis. Nice. <laughs> that's my that's my origin yeah. story. Uh, before we move on to Everton, Brentford made history. We need to mention this. They made history in their one or draw against West Ham this weekend. How is someone ever making history? With the one all draw against West Ham, I hear you ask. They became the first side in Premier League history to score in the opening minute of three successive games. They scored after 22 seconds against Man City, 23 seconds against Tottenham, and 37 seconds against West Ham on Saturday. Uh, unfortunately, they've only received one point from those three games. But what it got me thinking was how many goals would they have scored in the first minute against Man United? In <laughs> well, we'll find out. We'll find out on Saturday, the 19th of October. <laughs> 
Can you? I don't know if you can. Uh, you know, if you're into betting, if you can put uh, bets on like the minute that teams score. I think you can. But there, well, there you go. Not quite that specifically, but I yeah. think you can do like periods of time. They might actually suspend betting on that in a, a couple of days' time. Yeah, because it's yeah. That's How crazy. many goals can you? F- we've well, we've learned before. It only takes a second to score a goal. Fish. So could they score sixty goals? In the first minute against May United. Well, a police machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, police machine all over again. All right, Goodison Park next. Um, let's go to Goodison Park before we get out of here. Uh, Everton uh, beat Crystal Palace 2-1. They came from behind. They earned their first win of the season. Um, Crystal Palace were one lap at half time, but Everton got it done. Um, are we worried for Crystal Palace? I mean, the only thing I would say before you answer that is that a Crystal Palace fan in the way end, um, which was you know highlight of the game for me, held up a sign saying, Everton mints make you fart. Um <laughs> Which is which is pleasing. Yeah, but, but, but it also says on it, "Thanks for the football, Goodison Park." Yeah, so it's there's a bit of everything in there. There was totally. He thought, do you reckon he thought I've gone a bit harsh there? I'll just, I'll just, I'll just. Yeah, it's it. what, oh, yeah. I can't believe I've embarrassed myself on my last time here. But there's two, there's two teams that um, I think a lot of people thought would have a good time of it this season. One of them's West Ham, who mm. flattered to deceive massively. And the other one's Crystal Palace, who after six games haven't won a single game. They've got three points from from their first six games. They were. Uh, you know, ahead in this game against Everton, you've had a terrible time of it. Yet yeah, Everton were, were able to turn it around thanks to two goals from Dwight McNeil, but also I think the fact that Jared Branthwaite was back was big for them as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's another positive, isn't it? That's going to make a huge, huge difference to just how sort of confident and comfortable they are. Um, yeah, for, from the Palace point of view, it's should it be as surprising as it is? Given that they, you know, they 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 were flirting with relegation last last season, and then obviously Glasner's come in, had what ma- what what may now look like a sort of classic new manager bounce. He's got them playing some really good stuff and some really fluid stuff, and then lost, lost one some of players the, there. Yeah, yeah, it's you know, it is it is going to be a fight and a slog, isn't it, for them? I think they've got a lot of eye catching players like Ezra and and Uncle Mark, players like that, which make you think they're going to. Yeah, gonna he scored, of, of course. Yeah, he scored, well, yeah, game, they, yeah, they, they make they make you think maybe they're going to sort of be the kind of favourites in a lot of games when clearly it's not panning out that way. Well, we talked about that, um, I think, last week. The idea that perhaps the, the the summer, the end of the season came at a really bad time for them. Mm-hmm. You know, they won six of their last seven. They beat Man United handily. You know, they beat Liverpool at Anfield. You know, they had these amazing showpiece results. Um, I think they beat Crystal. I think they beat Aston Villa on the last day. Like smashed them five 0 on the final day. You know, um, it felt like a celebration at the back was. end once they'd secured yeah. like their survival. Yeah, I think. Well, I think Aston Villa had also been celebrating quite hard yeah. Quite yeah. as well. But but you know, the summer comes along at a difficult time for them. As we said last week, as, and as you've mentioned there, Jim, they had a really kind of um, rambunctious summer, and not in a good way because they were frantically trying to keep hold of their players. But I mean. Oliver Glasner is someone who people were like, wow, he could be a great new great new manager in the Premier League, a great addition, you know, a great change from Roy Hodgson who'd kind of run his course. They 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 weren't great against against Everton. They come off the back of a result where Everton have been poor overall. And I think you, you target a game at Goodison Park and you go, well, we can win there because it gets so negative so early and because there's so much upheaval off the pitch. You know, Sean Dyche, we talk, most of the chat we had about last week when it comes to Everton was Sean Dyche is probably going to lose his job when this takeover goes through, yet he defies the odds and, and, and gets a win. Yeah, it's, it's strange, isn't it? But you, you, uh, As you were saying, you go in there and think all the noise is from their side and all of it's bad. We don't necessarily need to do much, but... Mm. Yeah, it was just such a strange performance. Adam Wharton's been had quite an interesting start to the season. I think that's Why probably would you mean bad. Yeah, well, that, that was, was his, probably his best performance. Yeah, that was probably his best but performance in the weekend. Poor overall. But yeah, and you wonder if um, and we talked about the effect um, you know Elise going has on Ezra, where it's a, he's a you know he has to be more involved and there's a bit more of a spotlight on him, so he gets coverage, mm. well, greater coverage um, on the field anyway. Um, but you also think with Wharton as well, like you've probably lost an outlet there. You've lost someone who gives you that space that you can able to take the ball on the half turn and mm. you know break lines and stuff like that. So. You know, you wonder. I suppose that that is Glasner's job, really, to you know future-proof them when they lose a player like that. And it doesn't seem like that. The you know that work has come to pass in uh, in preseason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've got a couple of decent draws in there. Obviously, we know this Chelsea team are, are a, a pretty potent attacking force. They drew with essentially the Man United badge, but it still counts. <laughs> Yeah, it's like true. The, the reason for that. Dwight, Dwight McNeil, speaking of great goals, by the way, earlier, but Dwight McNeil scored a beauty. Yeah. It was a great, great goal. He um, exists in a space where I know he's not rubbish. I quite like him. And then he just he scores a goal like that, which is essentially like a side foot knuckleball into the far mm. corner because it wasn't like a conventional bend. Yeah. Where I'm like, 
could you be like brilliant or is this just like do you have do like you have a special flashes? move basically. yeah I yeah think, i think he's gone under the radar massively this season because of how poor everton have been yeah. three goals and two assists in the premier league already only 24 as well mm, yeah. yeah i think he's probably deserves a little bit more credit than he gets i would say yeah and i i do like uh Jack Harrison as well, who I appreciate has not had the greatest of um, starts at Everton, you know, certainly last season. But the, you feel like with the two of them, they've got two very talented, very different wide men. Yep, true. Um, but look, a good win for Everton. And, you know, the fact that um, Ipswich drew 2-2 at home to Aston Villa and what sounded like a fucking brilliant game. I listened to that on the radio in the car. Um, lift, that lifted Ipswich out of the bottom three. So Crystal Palace end the weekend um, yeah, in, in the bottom three. Um, speaking of Aston Villa, Emmy Martinez has been given a two-match international ban for offensive behaviour while on <laughs> international duty. Um, the ban was given to him uh, for a combination of humping the Copper America <laughs> trophy. Um, I don't know if that's the official term that was used in the report. And uh, slapping a TV camera after Argentina lost to Colombia. Look, before I get your um, take on that, guys, I just want to put this out there. I am really hoping he wins the Ballon d'Or. <laughs> <laughs> imagine, imagine. It's going to go right up his bum. They'll just stop doing it. Yeah, it's too big for a bell end, is, he isn't put, it? is he putting Vaseline on that Ballon d'Or? <laughs> <laughs> is he going to higher ground to jump at what? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, are we are we led to believe that it's, so it's uh, one match for the um, humping and one match for slapping the camera. Yeah, well, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so it's it's called. It was for, called the the official charge he was he was banned for was quote offensive behaviour and violation of principles of fair play. Do we know what body has like handed down this ban? It was the FIFA disciplinary committee's decision, right. but um, you won't be surprised, Jim, to know that the uh, the Argentine Football Association uh, heavily disagreed, <laughs> strongly disagreed with their decision. Um, but but um, the AFA released a statement saying Damien, his real name's Damien, by the way. Mm. Oh, Emil- makes sense. Emiliano is his middle name. <laughs> Damien Emiliano <laughs> Martinez is being held responsible for his offensive behaviour and the violation of principles of fair play. Um, you cannot skewer a priest. <laughs> on, we've been Watch through me. This. Watch me. And as, and as we learned from Marcus a week or two ago, Martinez has previously said it was a stupid thing and it's the only thing I'm not proud of. <laughs> and then um, he immediately did it again. It's quite weird because I was talking with a couple of guys in the office a week or so ago about well, how I think David Ray is probably the best goalkeeper in the Premier League. And there's a couple couple of votes for Emmy Martinez. Oh yeah, massively. Yeah, and, I think and, he goes under the radar yeah, because yeah, of his but, character. Yeah, this is what he's known for. Yeah, sure. yeah. I mean, it's not as though he's trying to get a bit of clout on social media to get himself a move. He's already like he's won the World Cup. Yeah. He's already doing amazing things. It's just this is this is the very core of the man. Mm. This is the essence of him. I yeah, love it. I absolutely true. love it. And um, before we go, um, should let you know we were duty bound really to, to let you know in case you haven't seen it that Fenerbahce <laughs> beat Antalya Sport two 0 last night. But the um, the main takeaway was Jose Mourinho was shown a yellow card uh, for positioning a laptop in front of the TV camera <laughs> to highlight what he thought was an incorrect decision by the referee. He was annoyed that Ed Dzeko's goal was ruled out for offside so he basically took on the role of director slash vision mixer, put his laptop with a replay of the incident in front of the camera and um, hoped that it, the cameras would pick it up and yeah. show it. The referee came over and gave him a yellow card for that but I just thought it was fantastic. Yeah, We know that if he speaks he's in trouble but <laughs> he's not even spoken here and he's still got books. If yeah. I mind, I'm in big trouble. <laughs> um, for I, I, uh, funnily enough, this is exactly the same way I watched the Anthony Joshua Daniel Dubois fight the other night. So, <laughs> was it? Yeah, yeah okay. someone uh, someone filming their laptop. So thank you. Um, oh no, Lu- oh no, Lewis. Um, one of our friends on the Patreon Discord said um, made a perfect point. I thought, which is Mourinho abroad is the perfect level of Mourinho. Yeah, you right. only hear the good stuff. Yeah, you haven't got a part of all the shit, like the endless moaning. It's great. It's like having him on your close friends on Insta. Yeah, or Wayne Lineker. Why is, why is Wayne Lineker involved in this? Because, because every he's, no- he's better abroad, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I don't think we want to hear from Wayne Lecker, do we? No, but sometimes you want to be like, yeah, he's still doing that. And then it's Are like you... pressing a bruise, isn't it? It hurts, but it's satisfying. A good reminder. Yeah. But great stuff from, from, from Jose. Still carrying on doing his thing. I mean, Fanabacha actually actually won the game. So, I mean, it's not as though he was trying to deflect. And I don't know how long he had to wait for the press conference afterwards. <laughs> Hopefully, it wasn't another 75 minutes. Also, like, um, he, I like the idea that he was there, like, bent over his laptop getting the screen grab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> hang on, no, hang on. I've got it. I have got it. Hang on, wait there. Have you seen this? Wait there. Um, <laughs> What is it on a PC? I've only got a Mac. (laughs) Cheers for watching another fantastic clip from the Football Ramble podcast. Make sure you click like on this video and subscribe to the channel, which means you will not miss a single upload.